And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the, upco the upcoming R RPG, RPG Light Strikers. And a, man, and, a, and a man who is very, well, light. <laughs> the hey. True Light. How are you doing today, man? Great, and thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a great experience, and yeah, I'm excited to be here, Mildred. Thank, thank you much. Um, so, I like to start with the humble beginnings. So, with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Nice question. So it actually started at a library. And in the used section, there was a used copy for sale of the original um, you know, D, D Dungeon Master Guide. Um, you know, originally created by you know Gygax and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So at that time I had bought that book, and previous to that, I actually read uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's um, Wizard at Earthsea. Mm -hmm. So my my um, familiarity with you know fantasy and whatnot was already beginning to to take shape. In addition to um, just the, you know the cartoons and the the shows and stuff during the eighties and nineties and you know throughout my youth. So you know without further you know need to go all into detail there. You know I picked up the D and D base set, started playing with my friends, and then I quickly branched off into AD and D, um, and I really really enjoyed. Uh, Dragonlance and Dark Sun were my favorite settings. So I read a lot of the novels, and those were the games that I pretty much pioneered for a couple of years. Yeah, dark. it's nice to it's nice to hear mention of it's nice to hear mention of Dark Sun because even even among even among people even among um this old school crowd that we that we currently have among us, mm -hmm. Dark Sun is horribly underrated. Yes. I'd say I'd say the only one that um that's more overlooked in that era is Spelljammer, which um Yes. The best way to describe I find the best way to describe Spelljammer is what is what happens when you put a bunch of game designers in a room and give them five lines of coke. <laughs> totally, man. Yeah, anything goes. It's 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 fantastical though. And it's it made for a very interesting, you know, kind of sci fi fantasy campaign. And I know a lot of it had to do with the the ships, the spell jammers, right? Mm -hmm. And and it was still a great concept, but but you're totally right with your uh, your description of it. Well, I'm being I'm being a bit hyperbolic, but it is de is definitely one of those ones where you're with with some of them. There's with some settings. There's an ex there's um an attempt, and I'm using the biggest finger quotes possible to to try and have some grounding. And then Spelljammer comes along and and says, "We are, we don't do that here." Exactly. Um. Now, when it comes to Light Strikers, when I first found out about it, mm -hmm. the um immediate re the immediate reaction that I had was, <laughs> and I'm I'm prob I'm probably going to be dating myself with this, but I said, "This looks '80s as fuck." <laughs> nice. Um. Oh, that's super cool. Go ahead, keep going. Sorry. With that, so. Taking that into account, what was what was the um, spark when it came to creating um, Light Strikers? So, you know, over the past couple of years, I've been kind of brewing up different iterations of what kind of RPG I'd like to play based on everything that I've played and what I've been able to, you know, kind of run for my group of friends mm -hmm. and what I've also experienced at, like, game shops and cons and what I've just been seeing on the Internet. Um, and I just, I've been a big fan. It's like, I'm not trying to play the nostalgia card and say like, you know, this is all for nostalgia, but like as someone who just appreciates and enjoys history and gets very particular with, you know, why I like certain things and enjoy different forms of entertainment, you know, I want to make sure that as I created the game that would not only be, you know, modern and moving forward and being an original synthesis, you know, I didn't want to lose sight of the things that I liked, you know, like your question, things that got me into the role playing and the fantasy genre. 
And, you know, the A's is a big part of that, which, you know, obviously is going to date myself. But, you know, all those cartoons from, you know, Funimation and just the plethora of, like, fantastical science fiction, anime, and, you know, superhero comics and things at the time, it's, it's all just kind of always, you know, dancing around and, and, uh, and my creative inspirations. And I was like, I got to make something that can capture this, you know, in a tabletop RPG game and just create mechanics that I feel will, will bring out the flavor and be, you know, fun and easy to play. Because again, I've tried different systems and I go around and there's a lot of awesome campaigns and rule systems and games out there, um, you know, that can capture similar feels or certain aspects of it. But, um, you know, I was like, it's, it's time to do the twist that I've had. And I've always been someone who also is creating stories and characters and, you know, drawn comic books and, and written things. And I was like, this is the perfect uh, platform to, you know, put that all together. Mm hmm now when it com now when it comes to the um the clash system that you're going with um yes. when i look when i look at how it works and the yeah. emphasis on using ju on using just um 2d6 in this regard yes was powered by the apocalypse one of the one of the game one of the um games that you had tried out when you were developing what um light strikers would be in your head um, it was a game that I definitely read about, but I, I haven't played that game per se. I know I've, I've looked through the rule book there, but I know that a lot of systems like to use D6s for, you know, again, a very streamlined and kind of like fast and efficient experience. Now, part of the reason that I used D6s you know, six-sided dice for the Clash system was because for that same reason, right? It's very streamlined. People have access to it. So in other words, if, you know, someone picked up, you know, the rule book digitally, chances are they would have six-sided dice lying around and they, you know, they can start playing right away. With that being said, I do have additional rules that do add polyhedral dice. I've always been a big fan of the dice 20 just because you know it's it's like a wow factor dice and you know hailing back to you know play D, &D it's always fun and exciting to get that natural 20 in that critical role basically mm -hmm. right so i do have rules that implement the d20 but i just want people to know that when they start playing the game if they want to just focus on role playing they want something that's simple and easy whether it's to introduce new players or just to kind of role play and get up to speed and not worry too much about dice, then you definitely have D6s and that'll be all you'll need. Yeah. Now with that with that in with that in mind, the I will admit that part of the reason the the uh, th that particular dice came to came to mind was because of how you have the uh, character sheet set up. Um, oh wow. That and that and with some with some of the material that I was able to get, mm -hmm. um, it seemed like the it seemed like the classes would have these sets of moves that. Okay. They, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Keep going. You said would, the... these set these sets of moves that they would um, be so that they would be associated with. Um, so, are you referring? Or go ahead. I'm sorry. So, my is when it came now. When it comes to the when it comes to the abilities of um character of character classes is yes. in the full book is the intent to have that more of a structured affair or more of a free form affair. A uh, great question. So it's going to be both, and. What's going to happen is, as you've seen in some of the promotional and available materials now, each class has its own basic, for example, melee attack or mm -hmm. defend reaction or range attack or, you know, powers. And there's going to be a continuation of different powers and abilities that you can select. 
and it's going to be a system that you can't, you know, necessarily have all of it in your repertoire. There'll be guidelines when selecting them. Okay. So this is good because again, if people come into it for the first time and you know, they already want to be able to look and say, okay, look, this is kind of what the general abilities are. And I can kind of shape my character this way and pick these powers. Or if they just want to play a game that, you know, they can configure to be somewhat like, let's say, a board game or a, or a dungeon crawl or something. Or, you know, they just want to focus on role playing, but just have these moves to kind of supplement. Mm -hmm. Then that makes it accessible again and easy to play. Now, for people who really delve into the system, who are going to be, you know, able to invest in role playing and really getting into the nitty gritty of character development, you know, I have a lot of guidelines and advice to make sure that when the Sage Commander, who's who I refer to for the, you know, the Game Master, is able to work with players so that you can very detailed and specifically shape, evolve, and mold your character so that the class becomes very unique. And you'll start to see this in some of my videos. I'm hoping to, you know, to continually put out more. But it's like I have, for example, like two Imagizard players. I have two Braver players. But you're going to see that based on what the player wants with their character, they have the freedom to start adding these different aspects. And then I'll work with them to say, okay, look, this is how we're going to, you know, experiment or your character is going to train and learn and practice developing his powers to fit your idea, you know, and then the kind of character you want to create, you know, and then again, you can easily blend that with what powers that I'll have available in the book, but you can again, work, and develop your own. Mm -hmm. Now, since since we kind of dipped into that, let's go let's go a bit into the classes that we, that you have. So we have, I believe, a total of one, two, three, four classes. Unless I unless I missed any. No, that's fine. There's going to be four light striker classes, and then. Um, I've updated to include elves and dwarves and similar to, you know, kind of like old school role playing, like an elf or a dwarf is kind of its own class, so to speak. Um, with that being said, if you were to choose an elf or a dwarf, you could still be a light striker class, or you can just follow the path that that race specifically kind of has for its, its, you know, culture and its own class. But you're right, though. The four main Light Striker classes are the four starting classes. Mm -hmm. um, so I want I want to go into I want to go into each of them and kind and kind of get a feel for your inspirations for the classes and what the um, what the play style for those classes is going to be. Okay. And I'll start with Bravers, which when I when I read off Bravers when I was doing the Kickstarter spotlights. Um, yep. I I ended up making a bunch of DBZ jokes. <laughs> okay, totally understandable and right on the mark, so kudos. Yeah. Because it's talk it's talking about <clears throat> them having an aura, them having fighting techniques, being able to dash fly and th and throw beams and I'm and I'm I'm just sitting here thinking this is this is a D and this is a DBZ character class. Exactly, and you couldn't be wrong at all. And that, yeah, that's definitely primary inspiration. And I'll say, like, from what I've enjoyed and, you know, what my friends have enjoyed when it comes to character classes and, you know, shows or animes or comics, it's like, I want this to encapsulate a fighter. And you, again, you'll see that the feel is very similar to something like a DBZ character, uh, you know, a superhero. And the, definitely there's a plethora of anime out there, right, where you know, Hunter x Hunter, or, you know, even, um, you know, One Piece, it's like, there's only so much you can do when you say your character is, you know, somewhat super powered, stronger and faster, uh, has access to energy and can fight. And again, I want to make sure that in this game, you're going to really feel like that. And you kind of have access to that all the time. You know, now you're not going to be overpowered by any means. You're not going to be, for example, as invincible, you know, as a Superman, you're not going to be as like unlimited with your power like Goku, for example, mm -hmm. Son Goku or whatnot, right? But 
you're going to kind of be able to shape your character to fight, you know, use energy and again, have fighting techniques, which the inspiration with, with that would come from, uh, you know, fighting games. For example, I, I enjoyed a lot of street fighter. I, I played the street fighter role playing game when that came out and picked that up. Um, uh, I'm probably, I'm probably going to have to talk about that one one of these days. <laughs> oh, no worries. I hear so much controversy when I, I've heard about it and it's, I it was interesting. I've saw there's definitely there's definitely better um better better um fighting game RPGs out there nowadays. I've kind sure. I back in the day I was very harsh on it because because of all the things that were that just raised my eyebrows like Blanca being a representative of Capoeira which was just a case of what the fuck. Yeah. But much much like the much like that Mega Man cartoon in the 90s Mm -hmm. I've I've softened on it due to the fact that it's very when you consider all the stuff that we have when it comes to the mythos of Street Fighter now, it's very easy to point and laugh at at um what White Wolf was doing with that book, right? But something that has to be taken into account is that they had very little to work with at the time. Sure. I mean, you had you had you had Street Fighter Two because nobody was really playing the original game. Right. Um, you had you had you had the animated movies, and at that at that point, I don't even I think I don't even think um, the alpha movie was even out yet, and mm. that's it. That's not a whole lot to go on. Exactly. Well said. Um, the same thing with the um, Mega Man cartoon. Like a a lot of a lot of the backstory we have now when it comes to Mega Man, that wasn't a thing yet. Right. So totally. it's, it's a case where they they kind of had to they kind of had to fill the blanks themselves, and I'm not saying they did a good they did a good or bad job with it. It's a case of I can't really fault them because I'd probably do the same thing if I were in that position at the time. Totally. Um, That's cool. I mean, again, we're all always going to be shifting our ideas and our opinions and our perspectives on things, and it's like you mentioned, especially because of time, you know, in retrospect and the way things you know, shift and our own, you know, opinions and whatnot differ and change. Um, yeah. That's cool. I'm glad you also know about that because it's it's surprising too. Not a lot of people, um, even who go far as back as role-playing in that time, maybe are familiar or know about a Street Fighter RPG from that time. Well, so that's super cool. I had ended up using that because of, because of the fact that my, fr my friends and I were... Vi were vi were and still are very big fans of martial arts films, of of yeah. all kinds. Whether whether it be, whether it be Wush, whether it be Wusha, whether it be um, uh, whether it be from other other countries as well. Um, at one at one point, we had watched The Protector, and we and we had, and we had thought, why isn't why don't we why don't we have something like that in a fighting game? Um, right. Even, um. I had mentioned one of my favorite beat em ups back on the back on the PS2 era was that Jet Li Rise to Honor game. Um, Ooh, nice. Partially because I liked how they did the whole twin stick approach: one stick for movement, the other stick for attacking. Yeah, yeah, I love stuff like that. See, that's a a great example of just how they incorporated the mechanics of the controller and whatnot to kind of fit this flavor, so it fit the the feel of of being kind of more like a martial artist with movement and stuff, right? Yeah. So super cool. And one now, one of the things I'm curious about with Bravers is it mentions yes. special fighting techniques. Now I'm get now. Would it be fair of me to say that not every um, not every Braver is going to be is going to be using their their particular fighting techniques the same way? Um, or to to put it in more video game terms, we're not going to be dealing with the Budokai Three problem. <laughs> yes. Interesting. So, um, yes. Well, that's the advantage of a role-playing game, right? It's like I can definitely have, you know, mechanical, you know, powers and fighting techniques available, right? And again, you'll be able to select a certain amount of these. But as you become more familiar with the system and as Sage Commanders, you know, and the players want to, you know, experiment, not only can you develop your own, but... You know, even in the powers and the abilities, there's there's going to be like utility and role playing involved. You know, so 
I don't want it to always feel like if you choose a power, you know, it's it's gonna just do one certain thing, right? Like obviously there are powers that can do that, but you can still be creative. You know, you can still use it. So for example, you have one where it's like, um, just as far as a braver goes with that speed, that kind of flurry strike, uh, you know, you might wanna play around with that in, in a role playing situation, you know, try to grab multiple things or, or just do something to confuse someone. You don't always also resort to violence, for example, you know? Um, Powers that might give you the ability to, for example, increase the strength to kind of get this really tight uh, bear hug on someone to kind of grapple them for combat purposes uh, can be used in different ways. You know, to maybe grab and pick up an object to, you know, help and save someone to move something, for example. So, you know, I want to always encourage people to be as creative as possible with their characters and, and with their powers. And now, when it now when it comes to when it comes to imaginaries, um, yeah, there were there were two interpretations that I saw of it. One is the um, spirit forging versions, where I where I looked at that and I said, "Am I going to have to recite the lantern's oath with this?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and spirit the casting lantern. effectively being the. Um, spell the spell casting ver version of this of this kind of thing i i look with that in mind would it be fair to say that imaginaries are are the casting class of the of the main four oh totally yeah 100 percent. so harnessing this energy that i i call spiritus they definitely focus on those two things now as an overall class they want to again explore the limits of it However, sorry. However, that split into, like you just mentioned, the casting of it, right, to generate effects, mm -hmm. and then the other one is the forging ability, so they can, you know, manifest things from their mind and different objects and, and materialize those things. So yes, that's a very, um, very accurate way of describing it. Yeah. Um, would is it one? Is it one of those cases where? Where um they were at at creation, they'd have to choose which one they're going to be leaning more towards, or is that not the case? Uh no, not the case. It's just part again of your starting kit and your foundation. Now there will be options within the class, so there are paths, right? So there is one that if you want to focus only on casting and get certain benefits you will have to actually give up forging and then vice versa. If you want to focus on forging and additional benefits only accessible to that path, then you would have to give up casting. Mm -hmm. With that being said, you know, everyone who is in a Magizard will always have access to both. If you stick to either a general a Magizard or if you stick to a path again, that is not one of the two I've you know, just mentioned. So, it's definitely something that's ingrained and available to every match to answer your question. Unless you again choose otherwise. Um when now I of course there's also the fact that they that it's mentioned that they can raise dragon companions. And I remember I, when it comes to that when it comes to the idea of raising dragon companions mm -hmm. and may, maybe maybe the way it's worded, the mindset that I have is that at starting out, the the uh, dragon is a very young dragon, the, about a about the size of your forearm at biggest. And yes. as you as you develop more, the dragon is going to increase in size. Yes, and I'll add one little description to that: is it's definitely going to be limited because of its younger age as you start to play. Although, you know, as you create your own campaign and work in different stories, you can, you know, still have a little bit of variation with that. But even at its youngest form, players are allowed with this companion to ride it because it has one of its first starting abilities is it can concentrate energy and it can grow enough to accommodate the hero and it can serve you know as a companion to ride upon and of course fly for a limited amount of time you know it's still it's going to have its 
you know, a general amount of stamina and duration, uh, which again will also increase as it gets older, you know. So it'll have still like, you know, limited attacks and, and just enough of, uh, you know, an endurance to still fly around and, and be, you know, a kind of a transport as well as a companion. But uh, you're definitely right that it will still be younger from the get-go and it will evolve. And when it comes now, when it comes to when it comes to uh, trick scouts, um, I look at I look at them, and one of the one of the main jo- one of the main um, jokes I had I had made was um, yeah. using Spiritus to to become akin to the Flash, or oh, okay. or to put another to put another way, um, referencing Shadowrun, a adept. Right. Okay. okay. So, I'm sorry. If a, a Magizard is using Spiritus um, externally, they're using it internally. Oh, okay. I can see why you made that distinction, and it's it's not too far off. But I guess the way I would refine that is they're going to be for people who want to be kind of like the rogue class from D and D. I want to say if you let's say you're a big fan of something like Naruto, you know, mm-hmm. uh, ninjas. So they're going to have a little bit of predisposition for being stealthy and being a little bit more, um, you know, gadgety, I guess you can say. But with the spiritus, yes, they can do certain things like amplify their speed, you know, maybe somewhat similar to a braver. But the way that I describe their ability of, Remstraria. I would say the easiest generalization you can make is something that's illusionist based, but yet still different. So they want to alter reality, right? They want to kind of use what you know Naruto has with you know their ninjutsu techniques, mm-hmm. uh, and and that lends itself to the ability to somewhat alter reality to different degrees, which in a way is illusionary but not illusionary. If that makes sense. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Uh, and then, sorry, one other thing to say really quickly is they are a little bit more combat oriented, like the Braver, probably the second after them, where they fight in a specific style that's pretty, I guess, funky in the way that they'll kind of dance around or kind of flex their body with with these trick blades that transform between melee attacks and using the bow. So that's another thing. If you enjoy rangers and maybe want to focus on archery, uh, you know, trick scouts are the ones that would probably be what you would enjoy playing. Mm-hmm. Um, I will. Ad- I will admit that the la- as as odd as it might sound, the last time I played a ranger equivalent, I ended mm-hmm. up playing it a, a bit more akin to the. Grammaton cleric from Equilibrium because something about that concept really stuck in my head. Wow. Okay. So something I'm not completely familiar with. Um, it's funny though. With Equilibrium, the first thing that comes to my mind is the uh, the movie. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm referring to. Oh. Okay. Okay. So I was unaware of the fact that is there, there's like a game based on Equilibrium. No, no, it, oh. no. What ended up happening oh, is we is I ended up house ruling, okay. the um, the abilities of the cleric, right? Um, name namely a uh, stance rule where, um, it was it was like in any spot within thirty any spot within thirty feet of 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 him as long as he doesn't move he can't he he can't be flanked or or ambushed. Wow, and. Cool. And can take and can do a blind fire with no penalties. Sweet, that's awesome. I would, I would love to play in that. I mean, again, Equilibrium is one of my favorite movies. Uh, I, I love the concept of it. Uh, and again, it's unfortunate too. It never really made a mainstream. You know, it's gotten kind of got popular and it's kind of faded away, and never really had the big, big budget or, you know, all I'm, that. Uh, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, yeah. Having a bigger I, budget ends up meaning having more people to answer to. And for the past 50 years, culturally, we've had a romanticism for 
um, the sole creative vision. Um, mm -hmm. And you can you can partially blame the movie brats for that for that particular mindset. Okay, you know where the where instead of the producer being the sole creative voice, it it turned into the director being the sole creative voice. Sure, and, and the auteur and all those things. Yeah. Well, the movie brats graduated under auteur theory. Um, sure. Of course, when it comes to when it comes to the brats, you um, you prob you you already know that you already know their uh, work because the um. The big ones when it comes to the movie brats are um, um, Coppola, Lucas, right. Spielberg, um, those those guys. Yeah, this is fascinating too. I'm actually a student of film history, um, and I'll have to talk. I don't want to, you know, plug this with like filmmaking and stuff since we're mm -hmm. focused on light strikers. But I'll have something to kind of add uh, and share with you afterwards. But um, yeah. no, go on. Um, I I totally find this fascinating and I agree. Yeah. Um, now the other, the the other thing to uh, the other thing I I can't help but notice um, is yeah. trick is trick blades, and I'm guessing I'm guessing that was um, inspired by seeing transforming weapons in a in a lot of different um, anime and manga. Of course, yes. Um, and yeah, trick 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 blades are pretty. I'm trying to keep them like elegant, you know, mm -hmm. so they seem rudimentary. Uh, in their basic form, you know, two twin blades connected by this um, kind of elastic cord with synthetic materials, uh, you know, created by these light strikers. Mm -hmm. So that way, when trick scouts fight with these blades, again, they have to kind of, you know, dance around and intertwine between these elastic cords because as you're fighting with it, you can not only kind of whip out one end or use it close range, but you can, again, attach them together in a way that the cord is what's going to be the bow. So you can essentially fire it as one. Hmm. And they're the only class that specifically trains and has the ability to use these. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's just really fun. I mean, they, as well as the Exalters, are the ones that play with you know, transforming weapons. Um, but I, I hope that, uh, yeah, people are going to have fun with that concept um, and kind of put a twist on you know, being able to either be someone who can fight ranged and also kind of handle yourself in melee. But again, if you want to be completely ranged, then that's totally yeah. up to you, and that's super cool too. Um, when it comes to when it comes to the fourth class exalters, um, yeah. and the fact that they de they design um, their own weapon tech and their own um, solo cycle decabots. Um, the main thing that came to me are th were things like the engineer or or um, a lot or a lot of um, tech based class tech based classes mm -hmm. and yes even the engineer in Team Fortress Two because I played that way too much at one point. I don't blame you, man. Everyone, I think everyone into video games had a fair share of Team Fortress for sure. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, and I mean, I, I'm surprised too. One of the big ones, just as you know, DBZ kind of instantly pops up for something like the Braver. Uh, huge inspiration uh, for Exalters is going to be uh, Transformers, uh, Robotech as well. Yeah, yeah. or uh, Macross for us purists because um, Harmony oh, Gold yes. can go eat a dick. <laughs> there you go. Right? Yeah, I always was like, got to that point with anime where I was like, oh, Macross, and you know. Do you remember love? And people were like, "What?" You know, like I thought it's like where we take the movie or Clash of the Binoids, and you know, I got into, you know, Macross Two, Macross Plus, um, mm -hmm. and all those other ones um, thereafter. But yeah, I mean, I've I've had a deep um, an interest and passion for things like you know Gundam and a, a lot of these mecha inspired uh, anime shows, and I I kind of want people to. Be able to enjoy that with the Exalter class. Oh, good! Right? Good timing, give, given the fact that there's a Gundam being constructed. <laughs> right. You've you've probably seen that they're do that they're doing walking tests with with the thing now. Yeah, I mean the way that robotics and technology uh, is evolving is like it's just it's mind blowing and it's exciting though. Totally. Mm -hmm. Um. And so and of and um. In more in more recent examples, there was the uh, the film that ended up st end up sticking in my in my head regarding um, Max um, Pacific Rim. Yeah, um, 
again, I, I watched it, I was entertained by it, but I always had this issue where I'm like, you know, it's kind of like Hollywood's take on, you know, giant robots, you know, and, and things like that. And, mm-hmm. and I'm like, it's cool. And it's great to see that on the big screen, you know, but, but I've always wanted to see, you know, kind of the more original uh, people get a bigger spotlight for that, I guess, you know, I would have loved to see, you know, again, like a Robotech or a Macross, you know, or there is a Macross film being developed, quote unquote, but it's in what's referred to by the pros as development hell. Yeah. Oh man. Espe- especially since um, the guy, they, they guy the guy they had earmarked to write it. He, uh-huh. he ended, he ended up dropping out of the project and working on the uh, Kingsman sequel instead. Oh, okay. Um, and when it comes when it comes to that project, it's it's one of those things where it's where it's been in development hell for so for so long that when it finally does when finally does come around, I don't I don't have high hopes for it. Sure. Yeah, I mean, especially being an anime movie, you know, it's like you know how hard that is. It took you know comic books quite a while to overcome that negative stigma, just as video game movies are still kind of struggling with. Um, and it's interesting because I want to quickly touch on what i conceive with the exalters and the decabots i want to emphasize uh as i get art and i know i need to definitely put up more visualization for the exalters but i really enjoy the design that transformers and Macross brought to that kind of sci-fi uh robotic style you know like the mecha i like it where it's a little bit more you know blocky or you can see certain shapes and things that transform from the kind of humanoid robotic form into whatever it becomes as far as like a vehicle or weapon. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I give much respect to Pacific Rim and, you know, even Michael Bay's Transformers, although like I'm sure a lot of fans, you know, I wasn't too entirely happy with. Um, and just my, my main thing about that, my main um, criticism is that the quote unquote, I guess you would say Western style of these robots they seem a little bit more, you know, kind of alienish to me rather than being kind of bot like. Right. Um, so I've always I've always saw that way with like I guess Bionicle, like one of the jokes that my buddies and I were making when Transformers first came out, I was like, these guys look like Bionicles. They don't look like Transformers, you know? Um and I feel like where, Pacific where Rim you was, sta- in in that regard, I'm curious yeah. where you'd stand on the mech designs in um the Battletech universe. Oh, so I love I love BattleTech. I also played a lot of. Um, are you familiar with Armored Core? Oh yeah, I oh, am. Okay. Ve- I am very. Fam- I am very familiar with Armored Core and its um, and some and some of its, some of its spiritual successors that I've that I've seen of uh, of late, like um, Mass Builder and Demon X Machina. Yeah, Demon X Machina. Exactly. I have a, a big Switch fan. Um, yeah, no, I love BattleTech. BattleTech. Is another one of these cult classics that's been going on for such a long time. It's never really had, I guess, the mainstream prominence of something like, mm-hmm. you know, D and D or you know whatever Pathfinder and stuff. But um, that I think might Bal- actually be a blessing, though, of not not getting that, not getting that main not having that mainstream spotlight. Sure. Um, sim- simply, be- simply because when you when you're in that when you're in that mainstream, there again, there's more people that you've got to answer to and. You don't have the um, you don't have the the degree of independence when it comes to it being a a um, unique vision. It ends up being a more compromised vision. Very true. Very true. And again, that's that's one of those things that happens with properties and and things that become successful is is definitely. I mean, something that just a quick tidbit of fascination. I you know I recently found out that. Um, the creators of Avatar, for example, had stepped down because they lost that kind of creative privilege when the, you know, the bigger powers that be behind it now want to go one way and then the original creators didn't agree, you know, and then that's unfortunate, you know, and as someone who creates, and even you, it's like you can relate where it's like, it's it's, it's a sad and a tragic thing to say, oh man, and, and you know, George Lucas, for example, too, where you see what you want and what you've created go completely when- opposite from the other people who Take when it, it comes when it comes to those creators, I will I will actually give them cr- give them credit for having the guts to walk away. Sure. Because 
it it would have been it would have been easy to just say, hey, we're getting we're getting exposed to a what to a wider audience with this. Just take just take the L. But yeah. instead, but instead, they chose to stick to their convictions, and that's um that's some that's something that's har- that's harder to do that's harder to do when that when um so many people are geared towards conformity and non-confrontation you know the whole nobody wants to be a troublemaker kind of mindset right um i will admit joke when i saw the phrase solo cycle in the uh, description i sure. will i will fu- i will fully admit that i got a little hung up on the cycle part of it and i was wondering could i could i build an exalter to be my own version of common rider <laughs> yeah right another you know awesome uh uh, you know, kind of Japanese series, but uh, yeah, why not? I mean, you know, obviously your campaign and your character would have to, you know, skew to be something that would have a lot of vehicular combat, which is totally fine. But um, yeah, you know, Common Rider, you know, Power Rangers and stuff like that. That stuff is also great and fantastical in its in its own right. You know, you'd probably um, like Garo and, as well. Yeah, yeah, or and even again, um, you know, the Macross and Robotech. Southern Cross, mm-hmm. you know, and 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 Mospedia or Mospedia. It's like that stuff is like super cool, right? With the the transforming cycle that even becomes the armor, yeah, and stuff. So like that that stuff is again totally in line with Exalters, and I'm glad you bring that up. Mm-hmm. Uh, super cool stuff, yeah, totally. Now, when it comes to elves, full disclosure: never trust an elf. Yeah. Um. When it comes when. Would it be fair to say that the that that a lot of the power sets with elves are more are in tune with are in tune with certain archetypes that are that people might be familiar with, especially with their especially with their affinity with nature? Oh uh, yeah, yes and no. And I, again, I always like to say there's a light striker twist, you know. So to just kind of briefly and quickly touch on it, uh, they do have again an affinity. For nature, mm-hmm. uh, this includes the animals and the insects of the world, but this also actually touches into the the life beneath the water. So elves are fascinated not only with the forests of the world and preserving and living in harmony with the animals and the insects and everything, but they also like to look to the ocean depths. So there's also like this land and sea element to them, which is in contrast to the dwarves, which I'm sure we'll get into next. Mm-hmm. And I like to describe them as being almost alien-like because the way that they have a tendency to behave and and move is is very, I guess, odd or almost finicky. And and their eyes, even though they they kind of standardly look human-ish, they tend to transform a lot when they kind of start to activate their powers and just the way they are is they'll kind of enlarge and change in shape and they can look almost bug-eyed, for example, or kind of orb-like, um, you know, gem or crystal-like. So that's one kind of different touch on them. And and the ears, I mean, you definitely can't have an elf without long point ears. But um, the way they've evolved and developed here is that the ears don't just go straight up. They're, they are incredibly long, which is a, a feature that I guess anime likes to play with. But it's almost like this... 90 degree angle where they they start to go up but then they they slant back mm-hmm. you know at a very sharp angle um so it's almost like antenna in a way but it's you know it's still an elven ear right but it's just the uh, the shape and the angles and stuff but um yeah i mean definitely if you like elves because of the fact that elves are in tune with nature you won't be disappointed but of course there'll be things that will make them again different and have um, a unique flavor to the world of lecture and now when it comes to dwarves um give, even with even with the whole the whole thing with with affinity with um earth and vol- and volcanoes and well buildings what would you say is the light striker twist when it comes to dwarves sure so one thing is they're not typical dwarves in there size so they're larger but they're not necessarily giants it's just one joke that goes around that i revealed in one of my my more recent uh 
campaign videos is they call themselves dwarves because when compared to the other humanoid races, you know, humans and elves and the other kind of less lesser uh, common races, they dwarf the other races. And not just by their kind of, you know, somewhat deformed proportions, you know, but just in their their way of thinking and somewhat of their pride. Mm-hmm. And one fascination that they have is that they build buildings that they hope can reach the cosmos. Like they they want to go as high as they can go. They want to just create something that is a combination of Earth and, of course, their twist on technology. And, and they just want to, you know, it's almost like they want to colonize. It's like they already have this in it desire to just keep building on whatever planets might exist or other worlds out there, but they just want to go up basically. So they have this, again, kind of in it desire for that or obsession in a way. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to, when it comes to that particular, um, that particular effect, when, when it comes to their abilities, their ability sets would would a lot of that be rooted in um in manip in manipulating earth and manipulating um stone there will be a little bit of that yes so that's going to be kind of their quote unquote magic or i like to call supernatural power and their mm-hmm. elemental infinity for sure because of the natural dwellings being again in mountains which crosses over volcanoes hence earth and fire but uh again they somewhat have a you know commonality between exalters um with their own form of you know technology and the way they infuse their spiritist and elemental powers with technology with building and again with their kind of fascination with you know trying to reach the stars for Mm -hmm. example but to answer your question that's definitely a part of it so if you built a dwarven character and you want to focus on earth elemental and fire elemental affinity then very possible and again it's definitely a a fundamental part of of what dwarves are for sure yeah i can i can definitely um i can definitely go with that the um i'm i'm hoping given given the um given the nature of their of their kind of building and some and the nature of um other aspects within light strikers Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that they do, that they don't necessarily have to be lim- have to be limited to ju- to just um to just the standard weapons that people associate the dwarf stereotype with. I.e., I'm not going to see a dwarf running it running into battle with nothing but a pickaxe. Right. So again, I wouldn't discourage anyone if they want to enjoy these tropes or like you say stereotypes like as far as what an elf is or like a dwarf like the typical like miner and with the hammer like that's still kind of fun right with with what they're known for in, in this classic fantasy and, and kind of what we've grown to enjoy but you'll definitely see a radical change as dwarves become more uh, exposed i mean obviously when you have the book and you get to see all of it but um you're going to see that they are also completely the polar opposite of what you said the stereotype, you know, stereotypes of them are, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, you don't also, I don't want people to think that they're going to play a dwarf again. And they're kind of locked into this, like you said, you know, pickaxe miner and, you know, all they do is, you know, just kind of chip away and, and try to get stuff like that. So it's not necessarily also going to be locked into just that kind of dwarf. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course the same thing, the same thing, same thing goes with um elves not not locking into the um, archetype to that degree right so you know coming from again like an original like D D, it's when you would play the the elf you know once upon a time uh you would kind of be a ranger basically it's like the same right you're like a a race and a class you know yeah uh, just like the dwarf right so you'd already kind of be like this fighter and whatnot so yeah, it doesn't necessarily say that if you chose an elf or you played an elf that you're locked into just one thing. It's, yeah, definitely not going to be the case. And now when it comes when it comes to how, when it comes to how the when it comes to how the characters advance, 
Um, mm-hmm. That brings me that brings me to a cup to a couple of things that I'm cu- that I'm curious about. One of them being the um, being the car- being the um, cards, and the other being how advancement is going to work. Is this is this going to be a more level based approach? Is this going to be a um, a more a more f- a more um, free form approach? How is how is it going to work? So. I provide two options where it's it's basically up to the stage commander to say, look, you can look at this structure where there's a level cap. And basically what that says is that as your characters progress, the most important thing to look at is the, uh, the stats, right? So you have uh, six stats. And basically through the course of your character's improvement and evolution, mechanically on paper on the character sheet, those stats, along with your HP, are going to improve, but there's going to be, you know, a cap. So it's not something where you're looking at one day, oh, my character has like 6,000 HP, and I have like 500 stat points on everything, and it's like you're totally untouchable. It's like there's still going to be kind of a, um, you know, like a ceiling. But with that being said, you can always continue to evolve like you were saying, kind of organically in free form, your character with what they kind of like learn from their career, their their goals and their dreams that they want to pursue as a light striker. And what that's going to do is it's going to open up more things for their characters that will have benefits for role playing and can also be incorporated mechanically. Mm-hmm. And that's that's something that that I'll um, I'll definitely be keeping keeping a um, eye on. Um, sure. Now when it now when it com- now when it comes to the um, when it comes to a bit when it comes to a bit of the when it comes to a bit of the lore of at of Adama, um, what would you say the technology level of this particular setting is at? So it's pretty advanced. I know a lot of people, when they first, you know, kind of read about it or kind of think about it, their general impression that it's very advanced is true. So in other words, what you would feel like is kind of like a modern living situation as far as like homes and different anemones, uh, you know, having access to like power, like, you know, a kitchen and vehicles. That's all there. And again, you have these transforming decabots, you have, you know, mechanical boats, you have a combination of, you know, airships and sea ships that are both mechanical or based around gigantic creatures, right? Mm-hmm. So I would like to say it's this, you know, fantastical or this fantasy type of science fiction. But I guess the way to kind of limited or put into perspective is that it's not at this point where you're going to be, you know, flying interstellar spaceships right now and, you know, traveling the galaxies and, you know, fighting aliens or, you know, dealing with things on, you know, I guess that level, right? But what I'm also interested in is as the world itself evolves, right? In other words, it's out there in the wild as people play it, as you know, I write stories, as the lore grows. These aren't things that I'm going to say are never going to be touched upon, or that you know can never be, for example, maybe explored or, or thought about. You know, the dwarves themselves already are are trying to again break that barrier, right? So that in and of itself is kind of a clue to like. You know, will will they reach outer space or you know interplanetary exploration? You know, is that something that maybe the dwarves achieve first or mm-hmm. something, or is that does that somehow spur this competition and cooperation with humans, with light strikers, for example? You know, and then where do the elves fit in since they don't necessarily have any interests in in things outside of the the earth? You know, the forests or the oceans, where they kind of want to go deeper still. They don't really want to go up. You know, so. I hope that that kind of answers your question. I know it's it's tricky because in science fiction and 
once you start introducing things like fantasy or science fantasy with technology, um, I guess people kind of want to draw these lines maybe or, or kind of have it fit certain, um, you know, like limits or, or boundaries or borders, you know, but, um, you know, I just kind of want people to enjoy it more with, like you were saying earlier, this kind of freeform idea um, of the blending of technology with, with the fantasy aspect. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not saying, I know that there's the mindset among a lot of people that, um, tech, that technology and, and, um, and, fa and, and fantasy have to be divorced from each other. Um, I've never, I've never gone with that notion. I think that, I think that there's a lot of potential in having them be, um, on the same page. Hmm. Um, Especially, especially when, when you when, like I I had this I had this discussion earlier on in the week, when you when you look at say the whole of the um, Final Fantasy series, all right, and, perfect example, mm -hmm. and I'm bring I'm bringing this up because I saw because I saw this particular non um, argument being brought up once again with um, the announcement of Final Fantasy sixteen, which I am curious about. Mm -hmm. There's there's this there's this idea th among some people that the er, that um the pre seven era was straight fantasy when even if you go back to the original that's not really the case putting aside the fact that the original has a has a um time paradox yes. um you're utilizing airships you're utilizing more steampunk s technology exactly. um. And you're and um, you've got the you've got a, you've got aspects from all these different um cultures throughout the series, right? So, a game like The Witcher is very much rooted in Eastern Europe. A game right. like Final Fantasy is not so much rooted in one particular style of fantasy, but more of a grab bag of different elements. And you see this a lot with Japanese culture, um. Taking this sort of grab bag approach with different um, concepts mm -hmm. to the point that um, that um, the relig the religious scene is this um, is this um, trail is this trail mix of elements from na from native Shintoism, Confucianism, right. and um, Dao Taoism and uh, Buddhism. Totally, and that's that's a very keen analysis and i'm glad you brought that up because again that serves as kind of the starting point and a lot of the inspiration for light strikers and that's what drew me into things like anime and manga you know and jrpgs you know and a quick side note i want to kind of set the record straight here uh final fantasy 6 is the best of all the final fantasies <laughs> but um are we are we yeah. really are we really doing are we really doing <laughs> this this whole we've got to cover our ass kind of thing Right. No, I don't want to. I don't want to get to all the comparisons. Uh, and it's just funny because a lot of people love uh, FF Seven as as their favorite. But it just kind of goes back into your um, your um, your observation, which was it's always been Final Fantasy as kind of this grab bag of sorts, mm -hmm. you know. And and again, Six, I think exemplifies this with the way that it has, you know, from the get go, you have this race of espers, you know, these like super powered magical beings and then you have this you know which is the starting main character and then you have magitech armor and you have that you know evil empire and it's like you automatically are just like whoa there's like crazy you know magic another world here but then you have this technology people are walking around it's like armor and like, like you said kind of the steampunk feel mm -hmm. you know and i love that kind of stuff so i think that's i think that's a wonderful way of uh of kind of putting that in perspective yeah. Now, when it comes now, um, when it comes, one thing that I was curious about because this is something that I don't, this is something that I don't see often. The first thing that I noticed on the Kickstarter page mm -hmm. was the SoundCloud link to a Light Strikers um, soundtrack. How did that come about? So, 
you know, with the goal of this being something that's multi-platform or, you know, transmedia, I want to involve as many different aspects of, you know, stories, you know, books, comics, hopefully anime, you know, movies. And, and music is a large part of that for two reasons. Is that, number one, when I was playing D&D and role-playing and stuff, I would just start to get, you know, again, dating myself like you're saying, but, you know, I'd get CDs, you know, eventually MP3s. But I would like to play music during certain moments if it was something maybe that was supposed to be more dramatic or, you know, a lot of combat scenes. It'd be nice to kind of hype up the energy by getting that going, let's say, during a boss fight or something that's, you know, much more intense or more dangerous than normal. And then the fun part was prior to that, you know, I I hadn't experienced yet people introducing music when I've also played uh, other people, but then it was kind of fun and interesting when Dungeons and Dragons themselves came out with like, I'm sure you know, like uh, like Nistar or these these adventures that actually gave CDs so you could listen mm-hmm. to, you know, the characters in the game or you would be prompted to play something, you know, or, or you know, have some kind of audio uh, connected to what was happening in, in the adventure, you know? And I was like, well, that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, just to quickly finish up answering your question, it's like I got a buddy of mine and other friends who have been creating music. You know, I've kind of dabbled. And I was like, yeah, man, I want to just have music accessible to kind of, you know, flavor the the mood and, and the game and stuff. Yeah, and I'm I'm all for I'm all for that kind that kind of thing because um it hel- it helps it helps give more of an, it helps give more of an identity to things and really there's there's way too much music out there to help to help um go to help go with um moods or e- or even re- or even reflect the general idea of a given um faction which is how I <laughs> do a lot of my soundtracking with um campaigns. Yes. Totally. And again, people when when people play Light Strikers, you know, they can totally use whatever music they want. And, you know, to an extent, they'll never be, you know, wrong. Like you said, especially if they're eventually home brewing and creating whatever their their own factions or their own style or mm-hmm. their own culture and, and whatnot. And that's another thing that I want to quickly emphasize is I want culture to be a major part of Light Strikers. So in addition to creating your character, uh, you know, there's gonna be a lot of information in the book that pertains to you know entertainment style fashion uh, music and then the different towns the kind of lifestyles and you know shops you know restaurants and things that as heroes and as players you can you can visit you know and there's going to be you know npcs or i like to call them allies and stuff that are already generated they have you know a specific kind of look and personality and background that you can just kind of interact with on a regular basis you know and kind of expect um, you know, oh, this person maybe sells these kinds of equipment or, you know, serves this kind of food and it perhaps gives you this, you know, daily bonus that you can kind of, you know, take advantage of before you go on an adventure and stuff like that. So, yeah, and like you said, I love things like, you know, music and, and adding stuff. It totally just helps the experience overall. Yeah. Now, presume, now presuming that the... Um that the Kickstarter manages to get to get funded and after all the paperwork is set, is said and done um mm-hmm. what would you be aiming for as far as a re- as far as a release window are you thinking um early 2021 yeah so i have it right now at i think december of this year so yeah end of december early 2021 um like pretty much the you know the foundation of the game the campaign and everything is there um you know obviously i want to collect and get a little bit more funding for you know artwork as you know most rpgs do uh and just to kind of fund it get the company up and running and stuff but you know until that day until it gets released you know i'm i'm always going to be open to feedback you know i'm doing a lot of play testing and as i started to do recently last week as i'm starting to put out um as many videos hopefully every other day or two hopefully um to just show different people who are you know creating their character in the world and kind of how how they're kind of like uh, interpreting it and stuff but um yes you know hoping very much so uh for full funding and um and getting that out there you know end of december 
early 2021. Yeah, and I I will definitely be looking forward to how, to how it shakes out. That yeah. that I can't that I cannot deny. Well, thank you very much, and again, I'm more than greatly appreciative and very very thankful for your support. You know, and even been able to do this interview and everything. It's uh, it's just it's very fantastic and um, you know uh, inspiring and stuff. So again, thank you. My ple my pleasure, and of course. I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time to brave the insanity of time zones to come all the way to the temple. Sure. And of course, any any time you see fit to return, the door is always open. Um, awesome. Just the policy around here is that drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. There you go. And of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. Yes. There'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>